I want to share with you a sort of a compendium of the gospel of Christ. And how it is expounded by God in the lives of his people. Now, as you know, when man sinned, there came a blight upon humanity, the likes of which no one had ever imagined. There in the beginning, before the couple were expelled from the garden, God announced the gospel to the devil, and the whole human race was present. And he said, the seed of the woman will bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And the revealing God's mouth was shut. It was nearly, it was over 2,000 years before God spoke on this matter again. That's what sin did to humanity. It rendered humanity spiritually stupid and unable to comprehend God at all. It is written that Enoch walked with God and then God took him. It is as though they were walking together and the Lord said, well now Enoch, you're, we're closer to my home than to yours, so you can just come on home with me. But he never did, so far as we know, tell Enoch anything about the Savior, about the seed of the woman. Doubtless his fellowship with God had to do with the coming flood that was to take place. Next person God talked to was Noah. He didn't tell him anything about Christ, didn't tell him anything about salvation, anything about the devil being defeated. He just told him there's going to be a flood and only eight people are going to be saved. Yeah. I know some people talk about Noah preaching, trying to bring people to repentance. These people... I won't say what I really think about it. God told him out of the chute only eight people are going to be saved. Right. Amen. No, Noah wasn't preaching at that time at all. He built that ark. Nothing was told him about the seed. I'm showing you what sin did to humanity. It rendered humanity incapable of trafficking with God or comprehending the greatness of God or what God is going to do about this dilemma of sin. Sin is more serious than people let on. There's simply too much uh, psychiatry and counseling and things like this. There's too much of this. There has to be another approach to rescuing men. About almost 2,500 years after the fall, God spoke to Moses. And Moses wrote up that God was going to circumcise the hearts of the people. And some years passed, and through Jacob he said, Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Thousands of years had passed before these were said. Then some time lapsed more, and Jeremiah the prophet, he leaked out some information. He said, I'm going to give the people a new, I'm going to write my law in their hearts. I'm going to put my law in their minds. They're going to be my people. I'm going to be their God. And I won't remember their sins anymore. Now, all of this is rather ambiguous, you understand. 
Sometime later, Jacob, he spoke about the subject of a coming Messiah. He said, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The prophet said a few things about the Savior. Isaiah told about the iniquities of the world being laid upon him. I'm talking here about how God got to telling the gospel. His name is going to be the Lord our righteousness. Ezekiel was given to see, look, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. And you'll walk in my ways. You'll do it without having to be told to do it. I've got no use at all for Christians that have to be told how to live. Something's wrong. In the new covenant, in the gospel, God changes people. He recreates people. He gives them a new heart and a new spirit and a new mind. Now, you know what the gospel is when it was finally unfolded. Paul told the Corinthians, I declared to you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that is a summation of the gospel. That's not the gospel per se. It's the pillars of the gospel. The gospel has to do with why did Jesus die? What happened when Jesus died? Why was Jesus buried? What happened when Jesus was buried? Why did Jesus rise from the dead? What happened when he rise from the dead? And that's what's preached. That, what the gospel is that preaching that message. Amen. You'll note if you're familiar with scripture that this was never preached in all the book of Acts. Nobody in the book of Acts told the people why Jesus died or why he rose from the dead. It was given to our beloved brother Paul to open that up. Amen. Now that brings me to what I want to say to you tonight. If you're in Christ, you participate in the gospel yourself. Amen. You die with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ. Amen. Let's look, I go through these three things and how you participate in it. You die with Christ. Romans 6 says we're buried by baptism into death. Now, some people think you bury because the person is dead. See, that's, wor that's of the world. This isn't why you're buried in baptism. You're not buried because you're dead. You're buried to get dead. You're buried into Christ's death. Why? Because that's the only death God will raise you to walk in newness of life from. So you were united with Christ in his death. That's what it says. Buried by baptism into Christ's death. So that we're dead with Christ. Now Paul said to the Colossians, if you're dead with Christ... Why are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Why? Why are, you, why are you subject to ordinances trying to regulate your life? Why, if you're dead with Christ, why? See, it's a telling, it's a telling question. We're dead with Christ. Ye are dead, and your lives are hid with Christ in God. See, the secret to life is death. That's the secret. Amen. You're participating in the gospel, dead with Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul elaborates somewhat on this. He says, the dying of Jesus is found in our, bo in our bodies. In our bodies, the dying of Christ is taking place. It says that the life of Christ will be made manifest in our mortal flesh, it says the next verse. Now I will tell you up front that the church has not done well in this thing of dying. Dying, the, the dying of Christ is made known in these bodies. 
in these bodies, the dying of Christ is made known. As I've said to you, and I blush to say it, but the, the church has not done well in portraying and living out the death of Christ in their, in their bodies. I encourage you to uh, seek grace to die. Amen. Die to sin. Yes, die to the world. Amen. Die to pride. Yes. Die to self-centeredness. Die to it. Amen. Then God will raise you up. But he won't do it till you're dead with Christ. You'll wallow in sin until that happens, till you die with Christ. And we are, we're buried with Christ. When Jesus was buried, he occupied the realm of the dead. I mean, this is astounding. Jesus was the prince of life. He occupied the region of the dead. Now, I know there's some people that say Jesus went to hell, but they're just wrong. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. They're just wrong. That's all there is to it. Jesus did not go to hell, the lake of the fire. His, the price he paid was on the cross. He was cursed on the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That's where he endured the cross. He didn't go to hell, the lake of fire. He went to the region of the dead, Amen. which in old English they used to call hell, the region of the dead, because it's difficult to distinguish everything about that region, exactly where the rich man was. It's just hard to distinguish. But that's where he went, to the region of the dead. And while he was there, he rejoiced in hope, the scripture says. He said, I'm yet going to see the joy of your countenance he knew he was coming out of that region. Well, in a sense, we're in the region of the dead. Dead folk all around us. Dead ways all around us. We're not always going to be here. We can live by hope in the region of the dead. Jesus did. He lived by hope in the region of the dead. He knew he was coming out of there and would never again enter into that. <clears throat> So we die with Jesus, we're buried with Jesus, and we're raised. We're raised with Jesus. Raised up to sit in heavenly places in Christ. We're raised up with Jesus. If there is one thing that uh, concerns me more than anything else in the religious world, it's the near total absence of divine power. I do a lot of thinking about this. I'm very concerned about it. Powerless religion. This, Listen, in God there's no such thing as powerless religion. Amen. If there's a Christian that's not powerful, he's denied the power Amen. or rejected the power. See, the grace of God that brings salvation, that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, but it takes power, resurrection power, to live like that. I say it is time for the church to have some power. We've had enough of weak churches. Enough, enough, enough. There needs to be power because the power is available. The power of his resurrection. Paul said, listen, I count everything but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That's knowledge, like knowing Christ like a husband knows his wife. It's intimacy. That I might know, have excellency of the knowledge of Christ. That I might fellowship with his sufferings and realize the power, the power of his resurrection. Resurrection power is coming back power. If you faltered or you've fallen, you can come back Amen. with resurrection power. Yes. See, that gospel's lived out. It's, it's lived out in us. We're risen with Christ to walk in newness of life. It's a powerful life. Amen. 
it's so powerful that when you will face the devil, our adversary, the devil, if, you, if he tempts you, you say no. Right. And he has no rejoinder for no. Right. He has nothing he can do with your no. In fact, James says he'll run away. Amen. Resist. That's what resist means. It doesn't mean duke it out. That's not what it means. It means just refuse. So when you're tempted to sin, you just say no. Amen. No, I'm not going to do it. Right. And Satan, that's, see, that's the power of the resurrection. That's what resurrection power, power does. And if we're risen with Christ, we're risen, we're risen with Christ seated with him in heavenly places, the glories that you can know, you don't have any idea. We're so, we're frail, this frail human, human shell that we're living in it renders us incapable of, of, of realizing what, the, what power we've got access to. When Jesus said such things as whatsoever you shall desire, if you shall ask, you'll receive them, that wasn't like some kind of a hyperbole or an exaggeration. This is the kind of power that's available to the people of God. I remember one time uh, Jesus was preaching to a multitude and it says, and the power of God was present to heal the people. In other words, the power, God doesn't use it indiscreetly. But you can, you can walk in that power. The power of Christ can rest on you. Now my point in saying these things is that the gospel is lived out in the people of God and that life confirms the truth of the gospel. If the church will ever arrive at a point when I say the church I mean the modern church, the nominal church by name only. If that church ever walks in the power of God, people will start believing the gospel. Amen. And if, so far as you personally are concerned, when you believe the gospel, you don't doubt it, you don't try to hunt for an explanation for it, you know the truth of it. When this happens, then this gives you assurance and confidence. You've been called to fight the good fight of faith, and it is the fight. To stay on your feet, you got to fight. Amen. But you've got to have this power to do it. You have to be dead with Christ to do it. You have to be buried with Christ to do it. You have to be united to the Son of God, not just theologically or by creed, but an actual experience. Amen. You're united to Jesus Christ. And once you are, you there isn't anything you won't give up for Christ if you know this. Right. Not anything. Now my prayer is that the power of Christ will rest upon all of you. Yes. Now, if you've had uh, some kind of difficulties, which we've all experienced, this is the land of difficulty, you know, yeah. that you ponder these things. Lord, help me to experience in a fuller measure yes. what it means to die yes. and what it means to live. Yes. Let me see it more clearly. May I be a city set on a hill. He doesn't say that the, you ought to be a city set on a hill. He says you are. You are. And there's no city that glows like the one that's died with Christ, been buried with Christ, and been raised with Christ. I leave you with those few words. I wanted to be adequate for this. I don't know if I was or not, but... I'm trusting the Lord that whatever clumsiness there may have been in my own speech, that he'll let you see what I was attempting in a feeble way to say, that we've got one more body of good news, let me tell you. Amen. Nothing to be ashamed of at all. You can shout it from the highest housetops, and you can live it out before whoever and if you do, you know how God works through Christ. You know that, don't you? If you have his life, he'll work through you. He will do it. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless these people and myself. 
to be notable examples of what it means to be joined to the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.